Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 13. Look down into verse 21 and, and 22. Just to refresh your memory, last week uh, uh, we followed up uh, Mark's lesson uh, with uh, detours, dead ends, and, and dry holes. And uh, he was talking about sometimes, uh, you know, we get to places where we just don't feel the hand of God on us, and, and we feel that uh, maybe uh, it's uh, dry spots. And I talked about Brother John used to talk about for the church to pray for him because he was experiencing a, a, a dry spot in his life. And if you remember last week, we looked at when Moses brought the people out of Egypt, that God led them. And, uh, you know, we've talked about it where they, they wandered in the wilderness. Sometimes God takes us into these dry places to test us, to prove us. Sometimes He does it because He knows that we're not ready yet to accept His will in our life and uh so we go through these detours and and actually they're divine detours a lot of times and uh the the thing we have to be careful of is not to be discouraged when we're in a detour or when we're at a dead end or when we're in, we're in a dry spot remember his promise he says i will what i will never leave you nor forsake you so if you belong to him, he's not going to leave you. Well, I don't feel like he's here no more. Does your feelings always give you the, the true reading of what's going on in life? Your feelings can, can fool you sometimes, can't they? And uh, that's why you don't really need to operate just on your, your feelings. Uh, God is never in a hurry. Uh, We feel like we're going around in circles sometimes, but you know, look at Moses for just a minute. Moses knew he had a divine calling on his life. Matter of fact, before he knew, his mama knew. You know, because they were to, to kill the firstborn Hebrew male child. And she put him in a basket and stuck him over in the Nile River, and Pharaoh's daughter found him and, and raised Moses. So he was raised in Pharaoh's house, had all the best education, understood the ways of the Egyptians. But his nursemaid was his mother. She got paid to, to raise her son through the government of Egypt. God's hand was on Moses. Moses knew that. And what did he do when he saw his brethren being exploited? By the Egyptian. What did he do to the Egyptian guard? Killed him. Murdered him. Then he fled. But he knew he was to be the deliverer. So what happened? He took things into his own hand. It wasn't yet time. So God put him out on another side of a mountain to find his wife. For how long? Forty years. Your mom has always told you special. God's got a special calling on your life. One day you're going to be a great man of God. You messed up. You murdered somebody. Now you're out in the wilderness for 40 years. Do you think you might feel like God might have forgot about you? Might be in a dry spot. Not quite where you thought you was going to be in life. <sighs> Lord, I thought you was going to do something with me. You know, when Moses left Egypt, if I'm not mistaken, I didn't, I should have researched this, I think he was 40. So now he's 80. Lord, if I'd have just known that that's what you wanted me to do back 40 years ago, how things would be different now. You ever say those kind of words? 
You ever make that excuse because time? I'm not a young man no more, Lord. I'm not a young woman no more. I can't do that. I'm. If it's God's will, then yes, you can, and he'll give you the strength and the power to do what he's called you to do, regardless of your, your time frame and what we call human terms. All right? Uh, it was about that time he saw the burning bush. And went up to sea. You know, then he started making an excuse. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not one that can even speak well. Well, that would probably be a lie because he was raised in Pharaoh's house. And he was being in training to be a prince, you know. So I'm pretty sure he could speak. But, you know, he, he made it. And God says, don't worry about it. I got Aaron to go for you in your place. He's going to be your mouth, mouthpiece. So now we get to this spot. In verse 21 and 22 of 13. And the Lord went before them. Now Moses, we, we know the story of the plagues. Finally the Egyptians said, here, take our gold and silver, our animals, just get out of here and leave. And so they left. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So he left it there so they could see his glory, his leading. And, you know, we have the same thing today called the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I've got to go. But when I go, I'm going to send to you a gift. And this gift's going to be with you. And he's going to lead you into all truth and righteousness so when you lean upon the spirit he's going to lead us and take us where we need to go and uh as they came out of egypt you know they they did the passover lamb and it represents christ the blood on on the doorpost of your your heart uh john sixteen thirteen. you can write that down it's just it it explains when God redeems us, his, He sends His Holy Spirit to lead us. And uh, the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us in today's wilderness. <clears throat> One thing I did leave out, uh, He spent 40 years in the wilderness. God was preparing Him. But that 40 is in the, the numbers in Scripture represents a time or a period of testing probation, trials. Uh, so he had 40 years of training. He spent 40 years pastoring sheep and goats. Why would God send him to do that, to train him to deal with people? Because he had to lead people. Sheep and goats, it's like leading people, you know. that They need constant watch and care, protection from the enemy. Show where to drink and where not to drink. If you will, go down to chapter 14, verse 8 through 12. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, Pharaoh let him go. But the Egyptians were what? Enemies to the children of Israel, which were God's children. They had done wickedness to the children of Israel. God is a just God. The children of Israel have been crying out for years for God to save them and to punish the wicked. So here we read, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He let him go, but then God hardened his heart, and he said, you know what, I'm not going to let them go. I'm going to go back and take my gold and silver, and I'm going to punish him, children of Israel. 
when God put it in his heart to do so. And he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, all his horsemen, his army, and overtook them, encamping by the sea beside Pahathra and Baalsephim. And when Pharaoh drew near, drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. I'm sorry. I don't know if any of y'all resemble that. I resemble that. I think about that so much. God delivered me, set me free. Said, man, you're, you're free to serve me and to honor me with your life. And we hit a little rock or heart spade or we feel like we're at one of these detours or these dead ends or we're in a dry spot and we just don't feel that God is really... You know, when you first get saved, it seems like... Everything you turn around and look, God's hands on it, and it's just miraculous, and things are great in your life, and you think, hallelujah, I've done, found the right thing, and then all of a sudden that's not there. And then I have a tendency to act like the Egyptians and said, look, it just been better off. I served, I, I came out because I thought serving the Lord, some great stuff was going to continue to happen, and you know, you got me out here in this dead end, and it'd been better off if I just stayed where I was at. Life was a lot simpler back in Egypt. Egypt represents a life of sin, of bondage, of slavery. Slavery to the devil. And we say, oh, well, it'd be easier just to have been back like it was, not to know no better. Do you know what a terribly aggressive sin that is in the face of God? To murmur and complain about how better off we were before Him than after Him? Or that He has left you or forsaken you at this God-forsaken place in your life? Yeah, you know, that's what He, he truly calls evil. You're real close to what they did back in the first century when he was casting out demons. And they said, you're doing that in the name of the devil. He called that blasphemy. And because of their fear, he said that that sin will never be forgiven. And people confuse that. It was blaspheme. But he was talking about the blaspheme of them attributing his miracles to the power of Satan. Many times we contribute things back that we should be very careful of. God didn't bring you to, he did not save you to bring you to a place and drop you off at the Red Sea to let you die at the Red Sea. He didn't do it to the, the children of Israel. And sometimes, in all honesty, when you read, they deserved exactly what they were fixing to get before God interceded. Uh, kind of like us there's lots of times that we deserve for god's wrath to fall and instead his mercy and grace falls on us we got to understand who we serve and why he brings us to these places he brings us to these places so that he may be glorified can you imagine standing at the red sea and being so afraid you're, you're encompassed, there's nowhere to go. And you know, because let's get real, there's a sea in front of you and hills surrounding you and an army that wants to kill you. You're in a bad spot. 
What should we do? Number one, you'll find the answer in verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, what does it say? Fear ye not. Now what were they truly looking at? Death. They're looking death square in the eye here. You're, you can't escape that. They're standing right there, and death is looking at them right back. They look this way, and they see death. If we march off in here with our children, our animals, and all this plunder that we got, we're going to drown in the sea. If we turn back, we're not an army. We're going to die. Moses says, fear not. Let's read on. Stand still. Any of y'all ever watch them old cartoons where something bad's fixing to happen and Fred Flintstone takes off running and he runs 30 seconds before he ever moves? I imagine that's how they were. Can you imagine they're, they're, they're try, how they would get antsy? They, not knowing which way to turn and, and, and wanting to get busy about something. He says, fear not, be still. Calm down. Relax. It's so easy to preach this, you know that? It's a whole different ball game to live it. But he says, fear not. Be still. Be still. Calm down. And see the salvation of the Lord. Why is that so difficult for people? <clears throat> Every race of people has a conception of a God or of God's Where did that come from? You think mankind just, I've heard it say in philosophy classes that God was made up by man so man could control mankind. That's given mankind a whole lot of kudos, isn't it? Given them a whole lot of smarts that they really don't have. That conception of God was indwelt in us. It says that we, if we'd never even heard the word God, would go out and look at nature and look at the sky, look at the plants and the animals and know that there was a God. God gave us that thing. Now, we've perverted it. We've turned it into following after gods that's of stone. We're followed after gods that are feathered or furry or, I mean, or ourselves. Trying to make ourselves into gods. There's only one God. He says, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. What does that mean? Keep your mouth shut. Well, I just... Know that I, I know what I see. Zip your lip. Because God says today you will see my salvation. But, anytime we start throwing butts in the way, we deny the power of God. God don't bring us to these places so that we'll drop off and be non-existent. He brings us to this spot so that He might be glorified, so that the world may see the power that God has. 
The world don't need to see your power, my power. We have no power. But what God allows us to have, he tells the people here to hold their peace. And he's going to fight for them. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Uh, excuse me. There's water here. Now, this is pre-Peter, so they couldn't even say, well, you think we're Peter? You know? There's an ocean. Here's an ocean. You want me to go forward? That they go forward, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on the dry ground through the midst of the sea. Oh, oh, well, that, that, that just can't, that can't happen. That won't happen. And you watch on National Geographic now, they say, well, really, they didn't go through the deep part of the sea. They were through the marshland, and they just went through the marsh. Uh, excuse me. God's Word said Moses laid the rod out over the sea and divided it. Not only did they walk through the Red Sea. They were on dry ground. The rest of the Scripture tells us that Pharaoh's army pursued in to the Red Sea after them. Now, I just have a problem with National Geographic's explanation. If they were going through the marsh and just mushing their way through the marsh, then it was truly a magnificent miracle that the Pharaoh's army drowned it in the marsh that the Egyptians walked through, wouldn't it? So I, I guess the ground just sucked them up into it and drowned them in the mud. Look, people say, well, you know, these stories are just to help us understand, to give us, if this is just a story, then Jesus is just a story. But you know, the funny thing about these stories, secular history says that they're true. They try to Say part of it is and part of it ain't, and they try to pick and choose. But all of it's true. God told them to be quiet, to be still, and observe what He does in their life. To show. Why did He do that for them? So in 2021, in 2022, in 2023, 2024, people like us know that we can trust in Him. That He has the power to split the Red Sea if He so chooses. He has a way of delivering all of His people. And He takes us to these dry places to prepare us so that we can bring honor and glory to His name and receive uh, rewards once we leave this place and get to where we're, we're headed, I guess I didn't need so many notes after all. In Exodus 14, 
verse 17. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. What's he doing here? He's giving them time to cross, and he's fighting for them. Okay? God is doing the work. What's the Egyptians doing? Well, they're having to follow the lead of as far as crossing, obeying, obedience. That's not a dirty word. When he tells you to do something, he expects you to do it. Obedience. Why? It's for your good. It shouldn't be a fear of punishment. It should be knowing that he is leading you to a place. So many times we don't want to obey, or if we do obey, we only want to obey because we think we're going to get in trouble if we don't obey. Truth of the matter is, he's trying to rescue us constantly. And be, by being obedient... He gets us through these situations that we find ourselves in. Are you tired of being in a dry spot? Are you tired of being in a detour? Are you tired of being in a dead end? Be obedient. What if they said, you know what? I just don't feel like God's in this right now. I don't know if I'm going to walk forward. But then they could have stayed and received what the Egyptians had for them. Anyway, he moved the pillar behind them. He was holding a place for them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that they one came not near the other all night. And Moses, once again, the magnitude of this is just more than we can really comprehend. This is not a 30-minute movie crossing. All right? These people and animals, it took all day and all night, maybe even days to get across the Red Sea. This was an undertaking. This was not, all right, we're across and, you know, I mean, in all honesty, to walk across Old Hickory Lake in some part, parts would take us a whole day, you know. Uh, Verse 21, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind, and all that night made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the hosts of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel and the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out thy hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians and upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. God is righteous. Now, all these Egyptians that he killed, you know, one of the strongest uh, Christian churches comes out of Egypt now. Uh, they believe in God, Jehovah God. Uh, if you will... Turn to Jeremiah 32, verse 27. 
Next week, we're going to be looking at, at dry spots or, or dry holes, and we'll conclude the lesson next week. But here we see we've, we've been to deter and, and then to a dead end. A dead end that looks like there was no hope for rescue, no, no place of, of salvation. In 32, verse 27, it says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Do you really think that God saved you and brought you off to this place? So that you dry in a dry spot? Or in a detour? Or a dead end? Do you really think anything that's going on in this world is too hard for God to control? The God of all flesh? The God of all creation? I think it's kind of like our Sunday school lesson. I think it's about time the church wake up and realize the power of the God that we serve and start acting and living according to God's word and God, according to his power, what he tells us to do. If he led you to a Red Sea and told you to stretch out a rod, would you do it or would you go back to arguing with him? It'd be better just to be back to where you was before you ever met him. I'm afraid that many of us go that route. Lord, what you're asking is too difficult. Look, do you not see this dead end? Do you not see what I'm up against? Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? He makes the crooked places straight. He takes the dark spots and puts light upon them. The bars of bronze is broken, set aside. If you're doing His will, there will be no obstacle that cannot be overcome by God Almighty. He's also made us a promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you really believe that? If you believe that, it's time that we start acting upon that faith that we profess that we have in Christ. It's time that we look up and look up high in it. Right. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't you think today would be the perfect day to accept Him? If you've been living in the past thinking life was easier before you met Christ, don't you think it's time that you repent from that and shut your mouth, be still, see the salvation of God in your life? John, if you'll come up and lead us in a song of invitation, if any of you need prayer, if you need to repent, if you need restoration, if you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now is the appointed time. Would you come down as we stand and sing? Page 256. That's all. Sing. Mm. Who at the door is standing? Patiently drawing near Entrance within demanding Whose is the voice I hear Sweetly the tones are falling Open the door for me If thou will heed my call I will abide with thee all through the dark I dream.